lots of times we think about Rotary and we think about business, and then I bring in somebody like Jack Shonkoff, and we think, well, what the heck does this have to do with business? Well, it has everything in the world to do with good business and how we build a better future. Um, and Jack is going to explain a little bit about that today. But first, I want to tell you about Jack. I, and I say Jack because I've known him for over a decade now. We first brought him to Atlanta as a part of the Blank Foundation speaker series. And um, he had the opportunity to meet with then Governor Nathan Deal. And it really helped shape and inform the way Governor Deal approached early childhood during his uh, two terms as governor of our state. Um, but Jack Shankoff, Dr. Jack Shankoff, is the Julius B. Richman Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Graduate School of Education. He is a professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, at the research staff at Massachusetts General Hospital, and director of the university-wide Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. For those of you who like to really learn about brain science and the latest news about why we kind of turn out the way we do, I encourage you to visit the Center on the Developing Child uh, website at Harvard. It's one of the most fascinating websites that you will ever visit. Jack currently chairs the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, whose mission is to bring credible science to bear on public policy affecting children and families, and the JPB Research Network on Toxic Stress which is developing new measures of stress effects and resilience in young children. In fact, part of the reason we all know about toxic stress, that term, is because of Jack. And as Tommy Holder, who is our business champion for early childhood education, shared as he was listening to his books, he said that some of them could put you to sleep while walking. Um, if you were ever in the need for a weighty tome to read that will expand on brain science, Jack issued a landmark report called From Neurons to Neighborhoods, The Science of Early Childhood Development, which is a seminal book and if you are into that, I would encourage you to read it. So with that, I am very pleased to bring to the podium Dr. Jack Shankoff. Goodness. Oh, could you lower your expectations for this presentation? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm actually... Um, so first of all, um, it's really great to be here. I, I just really appreciate the invitation. And... Um, I've been given the task of, um, in 30 minutes, giving you a, an overview of brain science and all this other science and how it relates to early childhood. But I just want to say, and I take the, um, the title of this session really seriously, uh, you are a big part of what I consider to be more diverse voices for this early childhood issue in a post-COVID world. Because not only has the COVID experience been devastating for families with children, um, but also for the business community. And I think one of the things that's come out of this, um, I had a really interesting experience in Virginia a month ago, um, where I was on a panel, it was their Chamber of Commerce and uh, with uh, four business leaders. Uh, and I left that session um, thinking that um, the issue of childcare and figuring out how to help families with young children balance work and home um, is, I don't want to overstate this, but it's looming as an existential crisis for a lot of businesses. Um, and particularly with how the younger generations kind of feel like they want things to be, to meet their needs. So uh, what I'm gonna do in this session is to um, give you an overview of some really exciting new science, and um, but start with a review of some old science. So first off, um, those of you here in, in Atlanta specifically um, are kind of standing on a strong place to start. I mean, I think at a statewide basis, there's you have support for universal pre-K, um, for four-year-olds, you have state-level commitment to salary parity between pre-K and K-5 to teachers. Those are very important things. And also, I had a wonderful opportunity to meet with Mayor Dickens um, two weeks ago, was it, Stephanie? 
And um, it's a very exciting time for early childhood in Atlanta, and I think he's going to really need the support of the business community to move his agenda. So um, I want to kind of set a context for my remarks first by uh, sharing with you three lenses that I bring to this issue of um, why we should be investing in the prenatal period and the early uh, years after birth. Um, for me, it started with a kind of a moral responsibility that we should have a level playing field for all children um, to kind of basically all be who they can be. And a, a responsibility as a society to kind of um, help families do the job that they do. Government doesn't raise children and business doesn't raise children, families do. Um, and um, that starts with a nice moral responsibility. I then grew up a little bit and realized that wasn't enough. I mean, it's, it's kind of important. And um, the field began to kind of really pay attention to the return on investment issue here. And not instead of, but the tent keeps getting bigger, right? And, and the data are, are overwhelming that good investments, smart investments in early childhood, um, do return, um, they return money to society. But some of that is kind of down the road. It's not, it's not the next reporting period and it's not um, in the next quarter, but it clearly is important for all of us. But what I'm gonna, uh, the way I'm gonna shape my comments this afternoon is to tell you kind of where my head is at right now, building on, not replacing the first two circles. Um, there's a tremendous untapped power, untapped synergistic power between advances in science that are breathtaking, that most people don't associate with early childhood, and the lived experiences of people who are affected by early childhood. And until recently, relatively recently, the li lived experiences meant the lived experiences of families raising young children, um, which are very diverse across a wide range of communities and different places in terms of economic security and, and other issues. Um, but I am now leaning in big time, and that's why I'm excited to have the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, we have to think about the lived experiences of people who work in programs uh, and work with families. We have to think about the lived experiences of policymakers and system leaders who, who basically are being asked to do a whole lot. And my new favorite topic, and I mean this, I'm not being patronizing, the lived experiences of business leaders and people who kind of have to um, run businesses, whether they be big corporations or family businesses, and figure out how they're going to recruit and retain workers. I'm not talking necessarily here just about um, workers in the childcare system, which I'll get to in a few minutes, but I think you all know, um, and I, boy, did I get a big dose of that in Virginia, is that um, there are a lot of business people who are worried about how they're gonna recruit or retain the kind of qualified staff they're looking for if they don't pay attention to what people are demanding um, in terms of their family needs. So, so this is for you. This is, I'm gonna go through, the, I'm gonna give you a lot of science, I'm gonna give you a bird's eye view of science, but my lens, not just for this audience, but for where I really feel a lot of the early childhood field needs to go, is to say that this is a big tent issue that all of us have a really significant stake in, even in the short term, not just how many years later are we gonna get money back. So this is the first of two videos I'm gonna show you. It runs a minute and a half, it's pretty quick. Um, this is your crash course in the science of early brain development and what we know about how the environments children grow up in literally, literally shape the architecture of their developing brains. So, A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later.
Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So if, if the basic message of this has come through, you now know the basic concepts of what neuroscience has to say about how the environment shapes early brain development. So what I want to do next is, is uh, present a graph to you that, that helps to illustrate why science informed early childhood policy. And by the way, the strongest science is science that coincides with what your grandmother could have told you and what common sense says. That's kind of really where the, the big hits are. So this is a lot of common sense here, but there's very powerful science behind it. It begins by understanding why early experiences are so important. So it has to do with this concept of what we call plasticity or flexibility in the brain, which is um, the sad fact, <laughs> but it's reality. We have to live with it. Is that the flexibility and the plasticity of our brain decreases over time. It's optimally at its highest point at birth. It drops pretty dramatically. And the first thing, you're all looking for your age. I know that. Um, so let me, let me just kind of tell you that it drops pretty dramatically, um, and then it continues to kind of go down, but at a slower pace. But the important point of this slide is it never goes to zero um, as long as you're alive, but it gets, it's harder. And actually, the cost, the physiological cost to the brain, how much glucose and oxygen it has to use to kind of deal with new stresses or new demands, that goes up because your brain has been wired early for what it has to deal with early, and then you, this is why um, every January when you are determined this year I'm gonna exercise more and eat better, it's not a motivation issue, you, it's hard because your brain is accustomed to old ways of doing things. So this concept of decreasing plasticity is real, it's not a new discovery, but you have to keep, we have to keep it in our mind about why starting early is so important. Now this next uh, very brief video basically is the complement to the first one. The first one is how Good enough environments, it's not that narrowly defined. We would have become extinct if we were that fragile. So wide range of normal environments and experiences. But what happens in the case of really significant, chronic, deep adversity, and this is the issue of toxic stress and its effect on the brain. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction to what the science has been that's been driving the field for the last 20 years. Basically, the brain science story. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an open up the door and give you a peek into what's been happening in the science of early childhood over the last 20 years that hasn't yet gotten into the ether, right? And this is kind of where we need to go now. A great opportunity 
for pro public-private partnerships, for the business community to weigh in for its own self-interest in terms of how to kind of uh, deal with the life circumstances of, of workers, no less customers. Um, so um, basically what I'm gonna now tell you a little bit about is this rapidly moving frontier of the biology of adversity and resilience. What is going on inside our bodies? Um, not, not kind of what does the world look like, what's going on inside our bodies from very early in life. And this has implications not only for the foundations of learning and behavior, but also lifelong physical and mental health. So um, there are three core concepts that have been not part of the brain science story that I'm gonna just name for you. It's a lot of stuff, thanks for the plug, Stephanie, but we don't get any royalties for our website, but there's a, if you're interested in this, there's a lot of stuff on there, videos and briefs and working papers. Um, so three concepts that are new that are now need to be brought into the early childhood field. The first is the interactive development of multiple biological systems that are developing. It's not just the brain, it's the immune system, it's metabolic regulatory systems, it's the cardiovascular system. They are all developing at the same time that the brain is developing and they talk to each other and they're all reading the environment and they're all trying to optimally adapt to whatever the challenges are. That's principle number one. Second is variation in sensitivity to the environment. I cannot overstate this. We, have, we tend to ask questions like, what does the average 12-month-old do? What is the impact of poverty or racism on children when they're growing up? What, what, what is the impact of an early childhood program? And we ask for like some average answer to that. And it's missing the essence of biology, which is variation, individual variation. So the simple examples are, Anybody here know anybody that has a family with more than one child in it? People will tell you they're not the same. They, if they have the same parents and they live in the same home, they're not the same. They vary in their sensitivity to what's going on. That's within a wide range of normal, that's biology. The other issue is we all know there are cancers that run in a family that have a high rate, but not everybody in the family gets it. And then there are areas where there's a high, sudden increased rate of some kind of cancer, and people say there's gotta be something in the water or in something in the, in the area, that, but not everybody in that community gets it. That's the essence of variation, it's critical. And then the third piece is this, the, the issue of timing and critical periods in development. So we have known that about the brain for a long time. There are things, the first video and the second one about when these circuits are being built, they don't get built randomly, they're built at very predictable times and once those circuits are built, they're done, the brain goes up to the next level, it's too late, it's a one-way street. It's too late to go back and rewire. And there are some parts of the brain that have tremendous sensitivity in the first 12 to 24 months after birth, and then it's harder to change it. Attention is one of those things, the ability to focus your attention. Um, and similarly, the immune system and metabolic systems also have very important critical periods. So, Pre-K, which is at four, which is earlier than starting kindergarten at five, is great, great step forward. Um, it's not that everybody needs a program, but four is like remotely early. It's not too late, but it's not remotely early, particularly for kids facing adversity where a lot of stuff is happening, all parts of the body that you won't be able to kind of make up for later. You can, you can work at making them things better. It would have been better to get it right the first time. It's cheaper, you get a better outcome. So. Um, I want to tell you, I'm going to take you inside the body now, and rather than just give you the headline, I want to tell you about what's going on inside the body related to stress. And the first message here is, I don't know, except for a couple of people, I don't know any of you, but I know because you're members of this organization, you know what stress is like. You have stress in your life. We all have stress in our life. And so this is, I'm going to tell you what's going on inside your body and what's going on inside the body of a baby when our stress systems are activated. So first thing is our stress hormone levels go up. Our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up. Our inflammatory system is activated, that's the immune system. Our metabolic system is kind of on overdrive. Um, forget the other things, they're a little bit more esoteric. Just focus on those. Um, this is good, our stress system is our friend. It's what allows us to deal with threat and challenge. It's why, it's why your stress system is activated when you're dealing with a challenge in your business world, because it helps you in the acute situation think more clearly. If you're physically threatened, it helps you run faster, it helps you fight harder, it's, it's our friend, it's good in an acute situation. 
The problem is it wasn't meant to be activated all the time or most of the time. It was meant to go back to baseline. And when it's activated, most of the time, it starts to have a wear and tear effect on your body. Whereas a legislator in Kansas said to me years ago when we were working out there, um, that sounds like a 24-7 adrenaline high for a long period of time. That can't be good for your health. And the answer is you're right. It's actually very bad for your health. So this is the difference. In a chronic situation, highly persistently elevated stress hormone levels, start, they're the things that are disrupting the circuitry in the developing brain of a young child, particularly affecting the parts of the brain where the fear circuits are developed. It overdevelops fear circuits. It disrupts circuits for simple memory. And most important, it disrupts circuits early on in their foundational period to help you focus your attention, follow directions, being able to control your impulses. So when you have those problems five years later, it's not necessary. If you've had a really rough life, it's not because you have a bad attitude. It's because that circuitry has been affected. Um, the inflammatory system, if that stays elevated, Inflammation is one of the major causes of cardiovascular disease. It's a major a cause of arthritis. It's a major cause of a variety of chronic diseases, and it's a contributor to cancer in many cases. And if that's chronically activated, you're on your way. Now we're starting to open up, the, pick up the hood and say, why do people who've had very serious traumas in their life, why do they get sick more? Why do they have more chronic illness? Why do they not live as long? We're beginning to get an answer to that. And the metabolic regulation issue, so in an acute situation, your blood sugar's up, it's great. If it stays up, you're more likely to get insulin resistance, more likely to get metabolic syndrome, more likely to develop obesity and diabetes. It starts early, okay? So, um, given that, it's not just about the brain, okay? The, the, the science is just sitting there saying it's time for a mindset shift in science-informed policy and practice in the early childhood period. And, here, is, here are some of the features of that. So we're calling, this is just new, it's only been a few months that we've kind of gone out in public. You're one of my early audiences, so if you have any reactions to any of this, please tell Stephanie so she can tell me because I need to know what people are hearing, I need to know what's resonating and what's not. The stakes are so high. So ECD 1.0, where the field is right now, it's all about early brain development and an environment of relationships which is still rock solid, as, as, as strong as it ever was. There's nothing, all of these things that I'm now gonna call 2.0 are building on 1.0, they're not replacing it. They're expanding it, and why? Because we have 20 years of science that have moved. So 2.0 is connecting the brain to the rest of the body in a broader ecosystem than just relationships. I'll tell you about that in a second. So you are my more diverse voices. We have to re-envision a much bolder early childhood agenda because we are in a world of striking and in many cases growing inequality that's a threat to all of us and a lot of uncertainty about where things are going. You all know that. Nobody, everybody's worried about not just how do we get back to where we were. I don't think we're going back in some ways to the pre-pandemic world. What does this mean for families? What does it mean for business? What does it mean for communities, for society? So, Here's the difference, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the difference between 1.0 and 2.0. So 1.0, it's still about, it's still about readiness to succeed in school, as strong as it ever was. But 2.0 says it's also about the early foundations of lifelong physical and mental health. 1.0, it's still about providing enrichment for young minds, reading to children, talking to them, providing a rich environment. It's absolutely about that. And it's also about protecting developing brains and other biological systems from the disruptions of significant chronic stress activation. And also understanding because of individual differences that we have to tailor responses to different needs. There are a lot of people living with very little income who are doing a magnificent job raising their kids. Okay? There are also a lot of people living with a lot of challenges who also are struggling with depression, who are struggling with addictions, who are struggling with violence in their family. And their needs are different from families who just are having trouble putting food on the table. And I'm being a little bit, you know, you understand what I'm saying. Um, it's still about ca caregiver-child relationships. At the end of the day, that's where the rubber hits the road. 
but it's also about communities and business and government working together to assure a supportive and health-promoting environment in which families are raising their children. We can't put everything on the parent-child relationship, even though it's critically important. So I'm just gonna share some data with you before I close and hopefully have time for some questions. Um, so there was a, a project begun a few years ago called the Child Opportunity Index, a group led by Dolores Acevedo Garcia, who basically collected data in the 100 largest metropolitan areas in this country. You're one of the 100 largest. That went down to the neighborhood and, and census tract level, have collected data on 72,000 neighborhoods in these 100 cities and collected data, everything from the, avail the availability and quality of childcare, of early education, of healthcare, access to healthcare, but also issues like stability of housing, um, air pollution, exposure to toxins. I know you have a recently identified um, uh, super uh, toxin site here in Atlanta. I studied lead poisoning in medical school. That was a long time ago. I can't believe it's still an issue, right? It's very damaging to young kids' brains. But also, um, and so they basically came up with a child opportunity index for each neighborhood. Each neighborhood has an index on 29 factors. Um, and here's what the data look like across the country. I'm not saying anything about Atlanta. Um, so 40% of black families are living in areas that have very low opportunity indices. 32% uh, of Hispanic families live in neighborhoods that have low uh, child opportunity indexes. 9% of white families live in neighborhoods with very low opportunity indexes. It's, it's not just about poverty, and you folks know that. Um, so investments, this is the health issue now. So um, here are three of the five most expensive burdens on the costs of our healthcare system. Cardiovascular disease, number one, diabetes, number two, and depression, number five. All of them are heavily associated with higher rates of adversity early in life. There's a huge, if we reduce the prevalence of some of these diseases by one or two percent, that's a lot of money. We spend, and these, are, these data are four and five years old, so they're, they're, they're not close to what the numbers are right now. So the take home message is that if we had more science informed policies and programs that reduced hardships and trauma and toxic exposures, in the first two to three years after birth and, and at the end of pregnancy, um, we would have a very promising pathway to enormous savings in healthcare costs, but that's way down the road. I get that. This is a legacy, this is a legacy issue for all of us. It's not a next quarter issue. Um, I'm gonna end with an example of, you, at first blush, you'll say, I'm gonna, I'd like to put on the table how 40 years of progress in treating uh, acute leukemia in children, which is the most common form of cancer, it has some very important lessons for how we could produce breakthrough outcomes in early care and education. So if you say, huh, what does that have to do with it? Here's my explanation. I'm not equating uh, poverty with leukemia, um, but here's the story. In 1965, when Head Start began, which is over a half a century ago, the five-year survival rate for children who were diagnosed with leukemia was 3%. So 97% of children at that time died within five years. 10 years later, the five-year survival rate was 60%, and it continued to increase. This only goes up to 2006, but right now, the five-year survival rate for leukemia in children is way over 90%, in some cases over 95%. In fact, the one group that's made the smallest progress are children under the age of one, for whom the answers haven't been figured out yet. So what does that have to do with early care and education? Let me try this one out with you, okay? Um, in, 19, in the 1960s and in the 1970s, there were two iconic demonstration projects for early care and education. One was center-based for three and four-year-olds. The other began at birth with home visiting, center-based. And they were the proof of concept um, projects. They had a randomized controlled trial and they showed one of them had more than a standard deviation difference between the group that got the intervention on developmental impact and the other one had close to a standard deviation difference. And then we went to scale, but not on these things. We just kind of went to scale, not on these models. And for 50 years, we've shown, number one, that we make, a different, we make an impact. The average impact is about a quarter of a standard deviation. So yes, we are making an impact. Yes, these programs are working. But they're pretty, they're, they're, they're not 
Why are they not following the curve of getting bigger and bigger impact? I'll suggest two things for you. Number one is the two proof of concept projects had very well-trained staff who were very well-paid, who implemented a very well-designed curriculum. And, and kind of large-scale early care and education programs across the country are staffed by many underpaid people who are very dedicated but do not have the training to deal with the magnitude of some of the problems they're asked to achieve. And yet, they still make a difference. So it's not even, if people were saying, half, well, quarter of a standard deviation, good enough. If the leukemia people had went from, when they went from 3% to 60%, they would have declared victory and stopped, but they didn't, okay? So, and also, if we had watered down, if we said, well, this is an effective leukemia treatment, how about if we water this down a little bit so it'll cost us less and we can get more out? Or how about if we have less, now that we know how to treat people, let's get less well-trained people to take care of them. We don't do that. Now, a lot of differences between the healthcare system and biomedical research, but the message here is that how did we make all that progress in leukemia? Anybody know how many new treatments were developed for leukemia in the last 25 years? The answer is zero, not one new treatment. What people figured out was there are different subtypes of leukemia. They looked at what was available and through careful study figured out which ones had the biggest impact for which subtypes and there are now multiple treatments based on variation that you decide at the time of diagnosis. So I'll leave this with this notion that once we prove something can do better, it doesn't mean that we can then get the same results if we water things down and we ask people with less skills to do this. So I'm gonna end with taking all this science and I think you should all be asking, so that sounds very nice, it's very interesting, but could you be a little bit more concrete about what, was, what we should do with all this? And there are three basic principles that are deeply embedded in science that I kind of want to leave you with today about across programs, across sectors, the same applies to health, education, child welfare, if you're a business person, if you're just an active citizen, if you're in the government, how do I translate the science into action? Three simple principles. We've got to support responsive adult-child relationships in everything that we do. So for business, it's how are we helping the people who are working for us to kind of deal with the work-life balance. And, and they're pushing back harder than they ever did, and they're not going to let up. So this is, it can't be finessed anymore. For child care, which is struggling right now in terms of just getting people to work in that system at such low pay. Turnover rates in childcare programs are not just an administrative burden for the program. Every time a staff person leaves that program, the children who are under that person's care have lost an important relationship, and that's a stress, and now they have to deal with a new one. Strengthening adaptive skill, skills and context, a lot to say about that, but basically, some parents need help in building skills about how to regulate their lives because they didn't have that experience when they were young. Not all parents need that. Staff need those skills. We have to build the skills of staff so they can do their job. And the last one, the big enchilada, is reducing sources of stress. It's not just helping people deal with stress, but it's reducing stressors because there's a limit to how much families with young kids can solve the housing problem and the food insecurity problem and the problem of community violence. So there really is a responsibility to basically, you know, put our money where our mouth is that we want to be a community or a society that supports families and the needs of their children. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who um, was a Nobel Prize winner. She was actually the first uh, freely elected woman to uh, lead a democratically um, uh, controlled country in Africa. Um, a remarkable woman, she said, the size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. So I would say the most successful businesses already say, yeah, that's what we do. I and mean, we figure out what we're good at, we make sure that we maintain the quality of what we're doing, but we're always thinking about where could we go next. And where we could go next often is beyond the capacity of what we can do now, so you kind of set that out as a longer term goal, and that's what R&D is about in the business world, and that's what kind of trying some things is about, is what we need in the early, right now, the early childhood field is facing an unbelievable crisis of rebuilding its basic infrastructure. We don't have enough people in, working in childcare right now. We don't have enough systems set up, no programs. So that's where the issue is right now, but we have to figure out where are we ultimately gonna 
strive for. It's going to take us longer to get there. But those dreams have to be on the table right now because otherwise we will never get below this kind of you know, modest, significant, but modest impact because this is about the future of the workforce, it's the future of the customers, and it's the future of a society that hopefully has much fewer people who don't have a lot of opportunity right from the beginning. So um, here's our website if you want to kind of do some trolling around. Um, and um, I want to end where I began, which is to thank you, Stephanie, and all of you for the opportunity to join you today. So thank you. We have time for a few questions. Jack, I can just leave you at the podium. Um, but one of the things I wanted to share with you guys, when we went and met with Mayor Dickens, one of the things that Jack shared was what happens in utero um, to a fetus who is um, exposed to an environment where the mother is malnourished and not getting enough food. So if you could share how that impacts um, issues, that would be... Really yeah, this has been studied in, in famine areas around the world for decades. It's like so, even in, the, in, in utero, the biological systems are reading the environment, trying to optimally adapt. We, humans are amazingly adaptive to lots of... So if there's inadequate nutrition during pregnancy, the developing metabolic regulation systems in the fetus and then big time after birth are reading not enough food. And so they're, they're setting their regulation up to conserve calories as much as possible. And because, based on the assumption that there will never be enough to eat, um, so how do you kind of maximally conserve? Um, when that's been studied in famines, where it was like a temporary uh, lack of enough food, when those babies were born, and they, were, they had lower birth weights on average during those periods of inadequate nutrition, when the famines disappeared and people then had enough to eat, um, and they didn't overfeed their kids, um, there was a long-term follow-up. The products of those pregnancies had more obesity, they had more heart disease later, they had more hypertension, because back to the critical periods, their biological systems were fixed on conserving calories at all costs, and no matter how much you tried later to kind of not do that, it was hard to break that. So that's one example. Um, the exposure to toxins is, a, is, the, is the classic example, because all these systems are developing and these toxins mess them up early on, so yes. So we've got a couple of questions. You want to start? Thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Testing? Okay. Uh, I know you know, and a lot of people in the audience probably know about uh, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and, uh, and documenting those, getting data on those. In Georgia, we've done that, or we've been working on that. And the second piece you probably also know about called HOPE, healthy outcomes from positive experiences and trying to get that data set in place as well. Can you elaborate on why that's important for oh, Georgia to do another study? Bless you. You know, you hope the things you leave out, you hope someone will ask a question so you get to talk about it. Thank you for that. This is so important. So for those of you who don't know, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, comes from a study that was done about 25 years ago that found this was in a white middle class population, adults, who reported uh, in their history in childhood having been abused uh, physically, emotionally, sexually, problems in their family, um, incarcerated parent, and they found that th there were 10 of these things. And the more of these things that you reported, the higher the prevalence was of all these diseases. We talk about obesity, heart disease, diabetes, depression. And so it sensitized us to the fact that what happens early affects health later on. There's a movement now to do ACE screening in, in childhood and identify who are the kids who have high A scores. Um, on a population level basis, it's a very valuable thing to do. I, you will not be surprised by my answer. So if you wanted to know for a given, a given community or state, um, how much are we at risk for these problems, do A scores across the, the population find out how they come out? And yes, you get very accurate. But if you use that as an individual measure for any particular child, as some people are doing in the healthcare system and other screening, it is absolutely not accurate for individual prediction because of the variability in response. There were three studies that came out in the last year, very carefully analyzed, showed that ACE scores were great predictors for population level risk, and they were no better than a flip of the coin, 50-50 on any individual. So it's very dangerous to do ACE screening on an individual basis. The issue about hope and resilience, thank you for that. 
That was part of what I was going to talk about, but there wasn't enough time. And then, yes, we should never think about toxic stress without thinking about the fact that the answer is not putting your hands up and saying, what was us, but it's about building resilience. And resilience can be built. It's built in part by buffering children, adults buffering children from this adversity, and then helping them build their own coping skills. And those coping skills don't come in automatically, like sitting and crawling and walking. They come in by role modeling from adults and coaching and scaffolding. So yes, resilience, you're not, we're born differently, but we're not stuck with what we're like at the beginning. And it, the one danger is to point to say, see that guy over there? He had the toughest childhood and he really made a success of himself. The rest of you, pull yourself up by your bootstraps just like him. Resilience has been studied for decades. And the one thing that comes out is it's always, there's always a relationship that helped people overcome it. You can't do it by yourself. And you certainly can't do it by yourself when you're a baby or when you're a toddler or a preschooler. So thank you for the question. So Real we have a question over here. You haven't talked about the decline in the two-parent family as a, uh, a reason for stress in a child. And what can be worse than having just one parent or having to go through the divorce of your parents when you're a young child? That seems to be the greatest creator of stress that you could have. Yeah, really important question. So I think the one thing, we, didn't, we knew this before the pandemic, but we certainly know now that all of us know how families, regardless of their composition, um, you know, don't just swim through, that there's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress in raising children, particularly in a complicated environment. There's no question that, quite frankly, I will tell you that um, I don't know how single parent families survived who have no money during the pandemic. There's no question two people sharing that responsibility is better than one. There's also no question that there have been many examples of one parent families that have done a remarkable job raising their kids and two parent families who haven't been the greatest. So again, it's about variation. There's no question one person responsible, particularly with limited income, is, you know, that that's really, really hard. Um, but it's it's more a matter of, of the, the how people cope and how they deal. And no one can make an argument that um, it's, it's just as easy for one person as it is for two. But also, no one can make the argument that single parents have not successfully raised healthy, uh, you know, competent kids. So at the end of the day, the fear, it's back to the ACEs thing. Be careful about overgeneralizing on a population and recognize that it's, at the end of the day, it's about individual differences for sure. I know Dennis has a question. <clears throat> Thank you very much for coming, and thank you for your insight that the business community has an interest in early childhood development in terms of the future workforce. <clears throat> now, Stephanie's uh, knowledge is more, much more up to date than mine, but in this community, we started a movement maybe 15 years ago, and Stephanie's been a leader in that respect, and it was very hard, and I think to this day is hard to get the business community behind an investment in early childhood, partly because it's such a long-term payoff. So as you look around the country or around the world, are there examples of communities that have been able to galvanize the business community to actually invest in this, even Sorry. with the long-term payoff. That, that's his timer going off, saying no, no, he said time. No, no, that was, I was watching my time for my presentation. I, I love these questions, thank you. So there are a couple of answers to that. One is, um, I was involved you know, 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago, when the early childhood group was starting to reach out to the business community, I would be involved in presentations, much less, knew much less then than we know now. And um, they were really interesting because there were a lot of business leaders who would come to these meetings and say, well, that's interesting, what do you want me to do? And nobody knew how to answer that question, right? And so when people say, well, I want you to talk to your legislators and make sure they support you know, funding for these programs, but it was, a, it was kind of a disconnect. And what I'm, what I'm this is not science-based, it's just kind of my own experience, is that um, the business community now is, is kind of focusing on this more and this long-term, issue is less the concern, it's the short-term issue that people are worried about. So this is like a perfect time for, um, I think the science is useful, but it doesn't have all the answers. So we need to have good knowledge at the table. Perfect time for people 
representing the perspectives of families with young kids, with working parents, and people working in programs, and you have to say, what can you reasonably expect from me? And I can't hold my, can you imagine for each of your businesses, if you were constantly losing your best people because they could make more money somewhere else, and there was a limit to how much you could give them to hold on? And to come to the table, families, community-based, right? Service providers and business leaders to kind of talk about what the immediate short-term needs are. Um, the issue of who's spending more money, oh God, I, 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 this, is, this is the first time I'm using this publicly. I just found this recently um, when you asked about other countries. Tell me whether it's a good thing to put on the table because nobody likes to hear that other countries are doing things better because people say, yeah, we're different. That's why we're a great country. Um, the average for all the OECD countries, the, the kind of advanced, uh, economically advanced developed countries, the average per capita expenditure most of it is on childcare, but on early childhood, it's childcare and family and medical leave. The average is $14,000 per child per year. It ranges from considerably higher to lower. The average amount, average across the United States, anybody wanna guess? $600 per year. It's, ch it's chilling, it's chilling. We are the only country in the world except for Papua New Guinea that doesn't have any paid family leave after the birth of a baby, right? As a government policy, obviously companies can do what they want. So, but it doesn't help to tell everybody how we're much worse than everybody else. Um, but the problem is when you look globally at where are we on reading scores and where are we on a lot of measures of population health, we're not in the top 20 on any of those. Now, it, the answer is not just spending more money, but it says something about um, how much it takes to invest in the health and the education of your population. So, um, and that's gonna be solved at the local level. I wouldn't worry about what the US should do, I'd worry about what Georgia should do or what Atlanta should do. And at the end of the day, um, I don't think any one group should be telling the other what to do, but now, unless I'm living in La La Land, business has a proprietary interest right now in this issue like it never has before. And, um, and so this is the time to create those tables and figure out what will work in Atlanta, what will work in Georgia, and not worry about the rest of the country. But I'll tell you, you do great things. I'd love to tell the Georgia story or the Atlanta story when I go around, because everybody asks, tell me what people are doing in other places. Last question, Clark Dean. Great, thank you so much. Um, what, what strikes me is, is just the incredible diversity of, of parties that have to come together to really do this work, to really understand it. Um, many of us in this room have been involved with the Center for Global Health Innovation and some efforts here to really bring um, the business communities, you know, public sector and private sector together and really have found that, that it's the community that's really the most important part of that, like really reaching into the community. Question is, is from, from your research and the experiences that you've seen of, of models being developed, are there any lessons that we can learn from, from you know, reaching into community with models, especially during the pandemic, to try to deal with some of these issues at scale? God, I love these questions. So fantastic. Can I give a two minute answer to this? Because it'll resonate with Georgia because there's a lot of military presence in Georgia, right? So it's really interesting. Back in the late 80s, there was a real, uh, there was a scandal about child abuse in the military. And a lot of it was about the pressures that military families were under, and particularly when uh, the fathers were overseas and the mothers were home with the kids. And, and there was a congressional hearing about this. And um, money was appropriate, and a decision was made that what the military needed was a good early care and education system to provide support for two reasons. One, so that soldiers, and at that time they were mostly men, think about what it's like now, that they could go and do their job without worrying about whether everything was okay with their kids. And as you all know, a lot of soldiers come from military families. So this was also investing in the future workforce. So for a, lot, for a long time, people talked about this as a great government model of how government, because the, the military actually created the highest quality childcare system in the country. It was like 95% met like the highest standards. It was like a model. People said, see, so government could do that. And actually, people said, actually, it's not a government model, it's a business model. Um, it was basically because this was needed so the workforce needs could be met. Now, the answer to that is, yeah, but the government, the military can order people to do things in a way that we can't. But I think what happened then, I wasn't there, but that they came together at a table. So they were given money and they were given a charge. And so the military leadership and the families and the troops 
and whatever community they lived in figured it out. Um, and it's still one of the, now the problem is that the demand exceeds the supply. When the period ended where the, where the military had to do it and there was money appropriated for it, there was no more money, but they decided it was so important and valuable, they kept doing it and they found the money somewhere else. So I, I'm oversimplifying it. It's not like everybody come to the table and the world is gonna be great. But I don't think there's an alternative. I think expecting the government, to, just the government to mandate things or just early childhood programs to do magic with no resources or expect businesses to figure it out for yourself. Um, this, uh, give it a try um, and, and basically bring good business know-how. We got a problem, we have a challenge, we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna kind of bring to the table whatever we need. I, I would love to kind of learn <laughs> what some of you are doing, and um, because th there's no alternative. There's no, and this problem is not going away. It's not going anywhere. Please join me in thanking Thank Dr. Jack Shankoff.